Hello, and welcome to another episode of Healthy Perspectives. My name is Vernon Solomon. It goes without saying that stress is inevitable. As humans, we have a specialized division of our nervous system called the sympathetic that helps us maintain high levels of brain alertness and vigilance and control the internal organs during periods of stress. Research has shown that individuals perceive their environment differently and that there are two basic human responses to stress categorized as type A and type B personalities. Type A reflects a more exaggerated response to stress. As we navigate through modern day life, individuals may experience different sympathetic nervous system stimulation based on the stress they are experiencing. What's stressful for one may not be so stressful for another. In today's episode of Healthy Perspectives, I'm inviting you to sit in on a discussion between two AUA College of Medicine faculty members, one a physiologist, the other a psychologist. Together, they'll be sharing with us the role our personality plays in how we perceive and cope with stress and how our bodies respond to being in stressful environments. I'm Dr. Rick Millis, medical physiologist at the AUA College of Medicine. Our guest for this episode of Healthy Perspectives is Dr. Danny Wedding. Dr. Wedding is a psychologist, has written a major textbook on psychology used in medical schools worldwide, has many publications, is really one of the luminaries in the field of medical psychology, and we're so happy to have him at AUA as our chairman of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Neuroscience. Welcome, Danny. Thank you, Rick. You're very generous, so I'm glad to be here. Good. So we have heard in the introduction to this segment that personality plays a big role in the development of cardiovascular disease. But for some of us, that seems to be a little abstract. For example, something in the brain dealing with your personality is affecting your heart and blood vessels. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Well, as, as a physiologist, Rick, you know how intimately involved your brain is with every organ in your body. And uh, Carl Jung once said that mind and, and body are inextricably linked and one can't suffer without the other sympathizing. So anything that affects your brain is going to have some effect on your body. And in particular, and, and most relevant to tonight's segment, uh, your brain affects your heart in ways we don't fully understand, but we do know that, that there are personality types that seem to be more at risk for cardiovascular disease. And there's been a lot of research and it's pretty uh, well established that some people are more at risk than others in part based on the kind of personality they have. Yes, we've heard about this type A personality. It, it's a, an interesting concept. It was developed back in the 60s by two cardiologists, Friedman and Rosenman, and uh, they discovered that some of their patients who were uptight and aggressive seemed to be at greater risk for having a heart attack. And if they did have a heart attack, they were at greater risk for having subsequent heart disease. And so they began studying this and, and they tried to get research funding. They weren't successful until they came up with this catchy label type A behavior. And so the type A personality is, is characterized primarily by hostility, uh, but secondarily by a sense of time urgency, this, this, this feeling that there just aren't enough hours in the day, and third, by competitive drive. And over the years, the research has, has held up the hostility component most strongly. So people who are hostile, who are aggressive, who don't like other people, who are always very competitive, who have to win at every game, if they're playing checkers with a five-year-old, they always win because they they hate to lose, uh, that kind of person is at greater risk for heart disease. I see, and I, it, a lot of these people would be accomplished people, wouldn't they, because of their competitiveness? Uh, oftentimes, they're, they're accomplished. It tends to be in the short run rather than the long run. They burn out, but they are accomplished. They get a lot done, uh, but uh, in the long run, uh, people who are type B, who are a bit more laid back, who have a balanced life, who are more relaxed, tend to get just as much done as the type A's. So the type B personality, you know, I don't think I'm type A, but I don't really know. Do I have to go to a psychologist to find this out? Or are there some personality tests that I can get done perhaps free online? Well, uh, an easy thing to do is just ask your wife. 
<laughs> but uh, or maybe your friends, but there are also tests online. So if you're interested and you Google uh, type A assessment or type A personality quiz, you'll pull up some brief quizzes that will give you some indication of where you fall on the scale. And uh, these aren't discrete groups. There's a, a scale and there are extremes on either end, but most people fall in the middle. Are there markers for this type A personality? For example, hormone levels or something going on in the body that will uh, trigger this stress response that produces cardiovascular disease? Well, they're what are called stress hormones and, and cortisol and adrenaline are the two most significant, the two most important. And uh, people who are chronically under stress have elevated levels of both. And uh, both are, are really very important and you need both. And, and stress is, is uh, the stress response can be very adaptive, uh, but it was more adaptive uh, in a, a age when we were dealing with saber-toothed tigers and that sort of thing. And now we deal with, with chronic, unrelenting stress, maybe uh, an annoying coworker or a boss who makes excessive demands. And so you just can't respond. Your body prepares you to respond in a physical way, but you, you can't. And so you stifle your emotions and, and cram them down. And uh, in the long run, that can have pretty deleterious effects. Are there some careers that are inherently more stressful than others? Oh, clearly. Uh, firefighters, for example, have a tremendously stressful job. And one of the interesting things about firefighting is it's a job where you're, you're bored for maybe 40 hours out of the week, and then you're in overdrive for two or three hours while you're fighting a fire, and you go back to being bored again. And then there are other jobs, like air traffic control, where the stress is chronic, where there's no getting away from it. You can't turn away from the screen. You uh, you can't take a break without having somebody there to cover for you, and so the, the stress is unrelenting. So I believe in our s next segment we're going to see somebody here in Antigua who has a very stressful job, and perhaps we can look for some of the risk factors in their daily life that they talk about that puts them at risk for cardiovascular disease. So, Danny, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Rick. I've, I've loved living in Antigua, and I've, uh, I've loved working with my colleagues at AUA. It's been a great run. Did you know that in order to diagnose asthma, a medical history, physical exam, and lung test must be performed? In the medical history, you would look for any kind of breathlessness upon physical activity, or even trouble breathing around triggers of asthma, such as pollen or animals. Normally, upon the physical exam, you would hear wheezing when you listen to the lungs. And lastly, there are the lung tests. The first one is spirometry, when you inhale as much as you can and exhale as fast and as hard as possible into a tube, which is connected to a machine. This machine will calculate your normal lung function, and if it's below normal for the patient's age, it can indicate asthma. The last lung test is the peak flow meter, which is relatively the same procedure, but upon blowing into a specific mouthpiece, will measure the force of air in liters per minute on its built-in numbered scale. This message has been brought to you by the American University of Antigua, College of Medicine, Asthma League. Caribbean 459, Imalian Bound, passing 2,600 feet. Caribbean 459, Roger, report Bopa. Report Bopa, Caribbean 459. My name is Hezra Mack. I've been in air traffic control uh, approximately 15 years. And the job basically is to prevent the collision of aircraft on the ground in the air. The service is to provide a safe, orderly, and expeditious flow of air traffic. 17705 landed 49. Continue vacate. Alpha contact 129 vacate. Typical day. The job. Uh, get ready. You go. You got your security. And then on your leave and location, you s I sign in. You, s you sign in to the logbook and check the log for any pertinent information pertaining to the job. And then you look around to see if anybody, because we have different positions, what you'll do, you'll see if anybody needs relief, and then they'll debrief you, and then you'll just assume a position, depending which unit that you're in. Stand by for ATC. The volume of traffic itself can be stressful, especially seasonally, winter season, Carnival, Easter, there's spikes, so there's periods where you might be talking to 15 aircraft. That by itself is a lot of stress because remember, you're solely responsible. And anything or any accent or anything like that, you're solely responsible. So you basically have all 
it's inside your hands to control. And other factors, mostly human factors are things that are out of your control. Pilots not doing what they're supposed to do, not following the instruction. And also, in our job, you have to coordinate and work with other airports and other air stations. So sometimes they might give erroneous information, stuff like that. And also, at equipment and facilities sometimes. You're not having the best, almost adequate equipment sometimes. That can add to your stress because you're not... You can do the job now, but you can be more efficient if you had more help in terms of like technology and stuff like that. The, those kind of things that will probably add this. They add stress. It affects people differently, but those are some of the factors that can uh, make the job more stressful. But it's mostly like the volume and the uh, human factors. <coughs> in the case of a major incident, we haven't really had, we were lucky inside VC, but we haven't really had that many within time. And since I've been working, there's a, there was only one incident where lives were lost and an aircraft had crashed. And uh, the controllers, they were given time off. And also, I think they were given some form of therapy, psychotherapy was given to them before. But it was an unusual situation because that kind of situation doesn't really... It, it's a, it was an out of the norm situation. We know that it can happen, but we haven't really experienced it. So it was a more something more reactive. But I think that will be, uh, in the future, procedures with that would be in place because uh, they got time off because it's a traumatic experience and then they also spoke to a therapist to kind of deal with some of the issues that had happened from the crash. Well, most of the time when you leave work I try to separate work. Sometimes I leave out um, you yeah, have your work but and then you have your, like, your regular self. So, but most of the time after a stressful day I just go home and probably just get a little rest because it's like a way to me you get a type of fatigue. It's not like you physically tired but you're mentally you just want to just decompress your mind maybe just lie down for a bit watch some tv or just do something outside of the job space just sometimes you probably just needs a little hour now just a little relaxation so most of the time i just rest i just do something i enjoy to just take my mind off of it asthma occurs when the airway is blocked or inflamed due to certain triggers it is very important to know what can trigger your or a loved one's asthma attack, as it can possibly prevent the attack from happening in the first place. What may trigger an asthma attack for you may not necessarily be the same trigger for your loved one. However, there are some triggers that seem to be impacting a large number of people in Antigua. These include dust mites and mold, as well as the smoke from burning wood or grass. Other triggers include cold or dry air, allergies, and airway infections such as a cold, virus, or flu. I would encourage all those affected by asthma to be aware of what can trigger it. By avoiding the trigger, you can ultimately avoid an asthma attack. This message was brought to you by American University of Antigua College of Medicine Asthma League. Although we can't avoid stress, there are practical ways in which we can deal with it. Avoid caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Indulge more in physical activity. Get more sleep. Try relaxation techniques. Talk to someone. Keep a stress diary. Take control. Manage your time. And learn to say no. And finally, rest if you are ill. Practice what you're most comfortable with. Don't stress yourself out trying to incorporate all these tips if only a few or even one works best for you. For more on how to manage stress, visit our Facebook page, AUA Healthy Perspectives. Take care of yourselves. We thank you for spending some time with us and for allowing us to share healthy perspectives with you. Be well, Antigua and Barbuda, and may your perspective always be a healthy one.